All right, well, with no further ado, let me introduce Norma Levy, our president. Norma. Thank you, and hello, everybody. My name is Norma Levy, and I, I am the president of New Plaza Cinema. Today, we're looking forward to a lively discussion about the 1953 Anthony uh, Mann uh, Western drama, The Naked Spur. I'm pleased to introduce our host, the author and film historian Max Alvarez, who is, the, who is also the author of a book called as it is, as it, as you will, the crime films of Anthony Mann, which is just out in paperback uh, from the U University of Mississippi Press. Max, congratulations on the book, and please begin. Thank you so much, Norma. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this online edition of New Plaza Cinema. Uh, once again, our, our partner in, in cinematic history, Gary Palmucci, is at our West End Cinema doing his typically brilliant job overseeing our exhibition of films there. However, I do have two outstanding uh, gentlemen who are joining me in a discussion on Anthony Mann's films today. We'll be having Stephen Smith, uh, a regular uh, with New Plaza Cinema Online, and of course, Daniel Cahill, who I'll be both in interviewing and introducing them momentarily. The Western genre, I don't think has gotten enough respect that it deserves in serious cinema circles, and I consider myself partially responsible. I was something of a late bloomer to the brilliance of 1950s, late 1940s, post-World War II Westerns being made in Hollywood, of which the, the Naked Spur is among them. The Western during that period, during the Cold War years, during this strange transitional era between World War II and the 1960s, served as a metaphor for so many things in society. The Western could deal with big ranchers versus small ranchers, ruthless railroad barons and railroad companies grabbing land, rich bosses controlling the sheriff and the judge, anti-Indian and anti-Mexican bigotry, anti-heroes with serious psychological baggage, as in the case of many of the Westerns Anthony Mann directed with James Stewart. When you look at films from this era, every director has his own Western style. There isn't a typical look to a Hollywood Western of, this, of these years. A John Ford Western is different from a Howard Hawks Western, which is different from a John Huston or a Henry King Western, which are different from a Henry Hathaway, a Sam Fuller, a Nicholas Ray, a Bud Bettacher, a Phil Carlson, a Robert Aldrich, an Otto Preminger, a John St uh, Sturgis, or a Robert Wise or Michael Curtiz later, and later Richard Brooks or Sam Peckinpah Westerns as the 1960s approach. Each director used this format to comment in some way about society and the problems within it, and the Anthony Mann films are no exception. Robin Wood, who's best known for talking about Hitchcock or writing about Hitchcock, wrote in relation to another man, Stuart Western, but it can be applied to the Naked Spur as well. But there's a characteristic use of landscape, never for the superficial beauty or mere pictorial, pictorial effect that is a cliche of the genre. But as in the classical Westerns you might say, see of certain directors, in Anthony Mann, the function of landscape is primarily dramatic and nature is felt as inhospitable, indifferent or hostile, if there's a mountain, it will have to be climbed, as we see in the Naked Spur. Arduously and painfully, barren rocks provide a favorite location for a shootout, which of course takes place in the Naked Spur, offering partial cover, but also the continued danger of the ricochet. The preferred narrative structure of the films is the journey. Anthony Manns talked about being fascinated by narratives in which the protagonist has to accomplish something as James Stewart does in The Naked Spur. And its stages are often marked by a symbolic progression in, land, in landscape. Anthony Mann didn't, is not on record for talking much about The Naked Spur. Clearly it's a film he admired. The characters in this film are extremely compelling and are in keeping with the characters that he favored in his, in his dramas. He, he, he was quoted in Cahiers du Cinema 
in the 1960s as saying, I always tried to build my films on opposition of characters, putting the accent on common points of two characters, then making them collide. The story acquires much more strength and you obtain a greater intensity. The public is involved and interested in what you want to show them. And certainly we do have a case in the naked spur of characters colliding, Jimmy Stewart colliding with Robert Ryan, Jimmy Stewart colliding with Ralph Meeker and also with Janet Lee. However, here is a quote on the naked spur from Man Anthony Mann. We were in a magnificent region, Durango, and everything lent itself to improvisation. I never understood why they shot nearly all Westerns in desert country. And he was citing John Ford's love of Monument Valley there. Uh, he wanted to show the mountains and the torrents, the underbrush and the snowy peaks, in short, to find a whole Daniel Boone climate. The characters came out magnified. In that sense, the filming of The Naked Spur gave me real satisfaction the rocky peak on which the last sequences were filmed was effectively called the naked spur. I said to myself, a spur must be the decisive weapon which punctuates the drama. And of course, it certainly is towards the end when Jimmy Stewart is pursuing Robert Ryan. We have Philip Kemp commenting on the naked spur. Man, a man stripped, uh, or Anthony Mann, stripped his narrative archetype down to the bare minimum, almost to the linear simplicity of a geometrical diagram. There are only five characters, barring of course the, the presence of the Indians at one point, and not a single interior sequence. And I know Dan Cahill is gonna comment more about this extraordinary location photography. Very unusual for 1953 when they were still doing a lot of faking going on. They were still trying to reproduce painted cycloramas and rubber shrubbery. In, in lieu of filming on location in sequence in, in, in a lot of scenes. In any event, this is a very powerful, a powerful Western. And right now we're going to take a look at how MGM sold the film. This was one of the last pictures man made under an agreement he had with MGM, which was one of the stepping stones he made from the Eagle Lion, Republic Pictures so-called Poverty, Poverty Row Studios that he had been working in in the 1940s. Let's take a look at the original trailer for one of five Man Stewart Westerns and one of the best. This is the untamed wilderness grandeur that seems untouched by man and into this mountain fastness comes a man in pursuit of danger this is the savage flashing story of this man the man with the naked spur james stewart fearless frontiersman with an iron will that thirsts for revenge and with a passionate heart that is hungry for love, the love of another man's woman. I wish there was some way to protect you from Howie. He's going to start on you pretty soon. Kev? Oh, I've seen him with women. He'll look and think, and then he'll reach out and take. And the way things are, who's to stop him? Me? How do you mean? I'm different. Well, I mean, you got a man. At least you stick to him. He's not my man. Well, you're with him, aren't you? Not like you and me. Oh, I'd forget. The raw and savage experience of a wild, primitive beauty at the mercy of desperate men. They gambled their lives for what each man desired most. James Stewart, willing to pay any price to create a future that will hide his past. Janet Lee, willing to defy any man strong enough to win her. Robert Ryan, willing to make any deal to win a woman and escape the law. Ralph Meeker, willing to betray friend or foe for love or money. Millard Mitchell, willing to join any scheme for any payoff. Quit that! Dead or alive, it says. Stop him, Ben won't have a chance. Chance at what, to kill us all? All right, if that's what you want, I'll give him a chance. There. Now, cut him loose.
savage desire seems to capture the spirit of many Anthony Mann pictures. And in the case of, whoops, this is the untamed for those of you who wish to see it again, I'm gonna, there we go. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I will quote briefly from a writer who talked about, who wrote about the Naked Spur, Jim Kitsis. He suggested in, in this film that the Naked Spur stems in part from the resemblance of the five characters to a malignant family bent on murdering each other at the first opportunity. And that seems to capture the narrative of the Naked Spur quite brilliantly, especially, and we'll talk more about Robert Ryan and his mind games trying to turn Stuart and Janet Lee against each other and Stuart against against other characters and and uh, and also putting paranoid thoughts into Ralph Meeker's mind at all. This is a very malignant family that we would expect from one of these psychological westerns from Anthony Mann. At this point, I would love to bring in Stephen Smith, uh, an Emmy nominated documentary producer, author and speaker who specializes in Hollywood history. His over 200 documentaries include Thou Shalt Not Sex, Thou Shalt Not, <laughs> Sex, Sin, and Censorship in Pre-Code Hollywood, The Sound of a City, Julie Andrews re Returns to Salzburg, West Side Stories Legacy. He's written two award-winning biographies on Max Steiner and also Bernard Herrmann. And he's spoken on both those musical artists for New Plaza Cinema. Stephen, needless to say, we are thrilled to have you back. I know we'll be hearing more from you when you officially speak to us at the beginning of June. But please uh, uh, welcome, and we'd love to hear what your association with the whole Anthony Mann legacy is. Certainly. Thank you, Max. It's great to be back with the, the whole New Plaza Cinema family. And this is my appearance is in the way of just a, a cameo uh, because I had the good fortune to work on disc releases of uh, several of Anthony Mann's crime films that you so eloquently discussed on Wednesday. And in the process, uh, we interviewed Mann's daughter, Nina. And I rewatched that interview. And when I realized that, that her comments at the beginning of the piece were applicable as much, I think, to the Westerns as the crime films, because she's talking about Mann's origins, I thought that might be something fun to share. So I, I just put together a little three minute video. And I should say that this comes from a project that you and I accidentally collaborated on. Uh, I had forgotten that we, we weren't were aware. Yes, we didn't know. We, uh, but yes, Max wrote wonderful uh, notes uh, for the classic flicks editions of these films. That's flicks with an X. And if you're interested in the movies that Max discussed, uh, T-Men, Raw Deal, He Walked by Night, I would say, even though they're public domain and you can watch them online, don't get them from classic flicks because a lot of time was spent in doing gorgeous restorations of those movies shot by John Alton. So here I, I'll, I'll simply share the first three minutes of this interview with Nina Mann, he said optimistically, and uh, I hope you will alert me if you can't hear it uh, or see it. So here we go. I got interested in a kid I read about in some records. When he was 12, there was a fire, and he risked his life to save eight other kids. He got a medal for it. I got to wondering what happened to that kid. How would I know? My father's exposure to storytelling and psychology were from a very, very early age, and I think that most of his films are steeped with an exploration of what makes this man tick? Why is he doing what he's doing? If you want to know what happened to that kid with the medal, he had to hock it at 16. He got hungry. The number of the films are about loners. I think he must have felt incredibly alone for 10 years, from three until 13. He was born into the Theosophical Society in Point Loma, California, and basically it's what we might think of more as new age thinking today, uh, but in its era, it was a very popular, you wouldn't call it necessarily religious, but philosophical organization. The exposure and traditions that he was brought up with were both 
Eastern in thinking, I mean yoga and belief in reincarnation. Tragically, his father became very ill and his mother thought that if they went back to Austria that it, they could uh, help him. And they didn't take my father. They left him from age three until his mother came back to get him when he was about 13. So for 10 years, he basically was abandoned. There was a Scott schoolmaster who would punish my father when he was misbehaving by picking him up by his, his ankles and dunking his head into a pail of water until he knocked it over, uh, which of course led to um, you know, my father having, as an adult, great fear of putting his head under water. He had never eaten meat or seen money, and I think he greatly resented his, uh, his mother when she finally came back and got him. I'm not sure whether his experiences at the Theosophical Society affected his later images of wanting to express rage or wanting to express anger uh, or, or battling out uh, in, in later kind of films, but it certainly seems like it's very possible. So there you have it. And with that, I well, just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. And uh, Max and Daniel are going to share with you, I know, a lot of extraordinary things about, about this film. A film that I will, I will close by saying it was released by MGM, made by MGM, but it's a testament to man's vision that it doesn't really feel like an MGM movie uh, at all. So I very much look forward to hearing what you have to say on this. Thank you. What a magnificent uh, interview, Stephen. Thank you for sharing that. I had the honor of speaking to Nina Mann on the phone 10 years ago when I was doing the research and just a lovely, a lovely woman. But that just to, to see her and, and see those images, just magnificent, but thank you so much. And you're absolutely right that this is not, does not feel like a typical MGM movie. Now, Louis B. Mayer has is gone from the studio for two years by the time The Naked Spur comes out. Dory Sherry is in head of production. Dory Sherry, who had gone to high school with Mann after Mann was liberated from that theosophical combine, compound and was going to high school in New Jersey. And then when Mann was at RKO in, 19, in the late 19, mid to late 1940s, Sherry is, is being brought in there to run production. And then Sherry will bring him and others over to MGM, very impressed with their abilities to make quality pictures on a, on a reasonable budget. Sherry believed he was much more progressive and, and liberal minded than Louis B. Mayer was. So he believed pictures needed to have something to say about the human condition, even a Western. So it definitely would encourage someone like Anthony Mann to, and his artistic collaborators to be more edgy and creative in the, in the, in the material for that. Uh, we'll, and so we, and, and Stephen is gonna be a part of this discussion once we bring Dan in, and I would love to, to bring Dan Cahill in at this point. Uh, Dan, who is a filmmaker, who has also taught filmmaking. He's our cinematography expert. Uh, Dan, you are dealing with really the last stage of three strip Technicolor at MGM before they, they transfer to the heinous Ansco color and mediocre Metro color. The Naked Spur probably would not look as special as it does in Technicolor. Please continue and share your visual insights on this film. Well, thank you, Max. And I'm going to leap into my PowerPoint slides as quickly as I can. Um, I want to say um, I'm, I'm going to be sharing a couple of other excerpts from interviews here um, as we proceed throughout the, the presentation. Um, here we have, obviously, the title screen. Um, worth reminding our audience here that Mr. Rolfe and Mr. Bloom, the authors of the script, were nominated for an Academy Award for Story and Screenplay, an unusual thing with a Western of this nature, especially in the 1950s. Did not win, but an important nomination. And here we have the real reason why we're talking about this film, which is the director, Anthony Mann. Um, and while we're gazing at Stuart riding out of the wilderness into their drama, incidentally on his 
own horse. He did not own the horse, but the horse was reserved for him to ride in 17 different films. The horse's name was Pi and clearly loved Stuart as much as he loved the horse. But I want to read you something from an er a late interview, 1967, late in his life with Anthony Mann, uh, conducted by the BBC. And here it is. What you see is the only truth. And if you can make it all the audience sees as real and as truthful, then you don't have to say things. If you ever asked anybody in an audience what an actor said or what an actress said, they would never know. But what they have done or some piece of business or some moment, they can tell you vividly because they've seen it. And that kind of sums up Anthony Mann as a very pictorial storyteller. This is one of the early scenes between Stuart and uh, Jesse Tate played by Millard Mitchell. Um, I'm citing it because of the one standout object here is Stuart's hat, which he wore in all Phil five of these Westerns. Uh, the Naked Spur is number three, by the way, and the hat got progressively grimier. And I just noted in contrast to the rather clean cut hat that the grizzled old coot is wearing. So Stuart was very keen on looking like he'd just been out in the rough. And note here, he's worn out an elbow in his jacket. Now, all I have to say is Hollywood should be careful because you never know, decades later, people could start ripping out the knees of their blue jeans just to look like their friends. And you don't want that to get to be a trend. Um, pictorial storytelling. Well, this one sums it up. Yes, there are words in it, but nobody has to say much of anything. This says, Ben, who bears a passing resemblance to Robert Ryan, is wanted for murder. Soon enough, we'll learn that there's something missing from the poster. Now, here we have an exterior action shot. And while you're gazing at this, I want to read you another interview segment, this time from the aforementioned Cahiers du Cinéma in 1957. And this talks a lot about what man's goal is. I don't like to shoot in a studio. I like to go on location essentially for two reasons. Number one, when you get out and see the landscape, you may be overcome with ideas that you never would have dreamed of on a set. A riverbank, a mountain, a tree, a rock, or something you find along the way might double the authenticity of a scene simply because it is there, because God put it there and you have to use it in the scene. Number two, the actors get much more authentic on location. In a studio, everything is quiet. Everything is built for the scene. The lights are on and you play the scene. But if an actor has to play the scene on a mountaintop alongside a river or in a forest, there is wind, dust, snow, the crackling of branches. All this interrupts the actor and forces him to give more and he becomes more alive. This is what I have discovered. So let me now look with you at this particular frame. And this explains one of the very challenging difficulties of shooting outdoors. Now, if you've never done this before, you might think, well, geez, you just kind of let the sun light everything and you push the button on the camera. Well, not quite true. This is under direct hot sunlight, not a cloudy day, but a bright sunny day. And if you'll notice, uh, the sun is hitting them from above and slightly behind. If you notice where Ray's shadows are falling slightly in front of him, that tells you the angle of the sun. Now, you note that Ray, further down the hill, his, his brim, the brim of his hat shades his face. If that were the case with Stuart, we couldn't see what he's doing or thinking. So they provide what's called fill light, an extra light to light his face. Here is another example of it the same scene a little further on, where we get to see Stuart's face, we can see some of Ray, Roy's face in the background. He's a little further from the fill light. But this is not an easy way to function. As soon as you get a set lit, the sun has moved in the sky. Now, we all know that the earth really rotates and the sun doesn't move, but that's the effect that it has on us. So you have to anticipate where the sun will be. Now in the 21st century, a director of photography has an app on his smartphone that tells him exactly where the sun will be in 10 minutes. 
for whatever location you have on the planet. But not so then. You had to guess your way through this. Here's another example of lighting where they chose not to illuminate Stuart's face because he is clearly saddened by the death of all the Indians due to Roy's rambunctious nature with the Indian women. And his face is used as a silhouette as he rides off the plane of desolation here, his face is in, in deep shadow. Here is one other lighting technique, and this is also called Day for Night, which is the title of a well-known Truffaut film that we've discussed. Um, this, to me, looks like a broad daylight scene. The sky is not black as for night, but it's dark blue. And Stuart is lit by what would appear to be the overhead sun. And the way they've made it look dark enough to pass for night is simply to put a filter over the camera works a lot. This is one of the better examples of day for night I've seen. They don't always convey it effectively. And you look and go, that's not really night, is it? Here we have the introduction of Robert Ryan and Janet Lee. And this is sort of in keeping with or embodies a theme that I've discovered uh, this week as a means of over preparing for this presentation. I watched all five of the Man Stewart Westerns. And there is a theme which recurs in at least four of the five, which is that the leading lady, in this case, Ms. Lee, enters the film smitten with the villain, Mr. Ryan. And over the course of the film, she gets exposed continually to how bad a person he is. So that by the end of the film, she is repudiating the villain and starting to look romantically at James Stewart, which is the pattern in this film again as well. Here we see what Stewart had removed from the poster, the fact that there is a $5,000 reward, which he didn't want everybody to know. Now that it's out in the open, it becomes a bargaining chip in the, in the entire plot. Robert Ryan deserves his own close up here. Uh, this guy was a really good actor. I know, I think Max has some comments from Anthony Mann about him, but uh, he was an outstanding actor in his era. And just to kind of clear up what he might have been like as a person, he was very progressive in his politics, which by my definition means he's a very good person. And he was one of Hollywood's leaders in supporting the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. Here we have another bit of just unspoken characterization, this being the bottom of Roy's discharge from the army which describes him as morally unstable and unsatisfactory. When you read that, it tells you everything you need to know about him. Although when you look at Ralph Meeker's face, you never really trust this man, even when he's being smiling and cheerful. He's going to rat on you. You know that. And even when he's playing a lead, as in Kiss Me Deadly, he's still kind of the underbelly of private detection. This is an excellent example of what Jim Stewart did in Westerns and all of the films he made. He was known for, whenever possible, doing all of his stunt work. And here we see him face to the camera. And believe me, there are no special effects here, no CGI, no green screen backdrops. These are rocks being dropped. Now, were they real rocks? They could have been paper mache, but Jimmy Stewart is getting out of the way. He puts himself in danger in order to shoot a scene, and you got to kind of respect that. And speaking of stunt work, well, this is from 1952, before the ASPCA got involved and started legitimately posting signs at the end of each film that no animals were harmed in the production of this film, but that was decades later. Here we have another example of Anthony Mann's pictorial storytelling. One shot, and you see what Robert Ryan's hands are doing. He is loosening the cinch on Stuart's saddle. And we all know from just about every Western, if your cinch isn't tight, you're going to go over, as happens pretty soon here. This is a little too dark to discern, but it's a moment of lightness in a film that desperately needs it, where during the cave sequence, 
they've set out their dinner dishes for the rain to wash them, and they're playing a bit of out of kilter music. Here is a fight scene, which could have been an ordinary fight scene, but man has somehow incorporated a coil of rope as the principal weapon used between these two guys. It's very effective, very unusual. I don't think I've seen a similar fight scene and I've seen a zillion of them. This is now towards the end of the film. Um, this is just an interesting example of, I can't call it deep focus because Ben on the top of this cliff in the background is not really in terribly sharp focus, but it's deep perspective. And we see what he's doing. He's taking target practice on the dead Jesse's boots, which pretty well cements the fact that the guy is a callous villain. And by now, Janet Lee is looking for ways to get away from him. This is another demonstration of this time Ralph Meeker's bravery in doing what looks like a scary stunt. Now, he's crossing the, this raging river on a rope, hand over hand. I will note that in the previous angle, which was a wide angle shot, the actor or stuntman had his back to the camera, which is usually a pretty good sign that there is a stunt double at work. But here, he's doing the real thing. All right, folks, this frame is a warning to all of you who would like to do what I'm doing. I think this was a sign that I have seen this movie too many times. On my third pass through the film, as I was capturing frames, I noticed in the lower right corner of the frame, and you don't see it moving very much, but there is a log roaring down this river. And I thought, wait a minute, that can't be the log that kills Meeker in five or 10 minutes. That's another log that was randomly floating by so I watched carefully, and there are several other views of the river, not from above, but more from on the level of the river, and we see logs randomly floating at high speed down the river. Now, this occurs to me as either, as I said, I've been watching this movie far too much, or it's a way of foreshadowing the eventual death of Ralph Meeker at the hands of a dangerous log. Um, in these previous shots, man never used a close-up to say, ooh, there's a log coming until the big bad log comes. So I think it's just his way of foreshadowing and also making it more plausible that a log could really come by and kill one of the lead characters. And I will tell you right now, folks, I do not know how they got this shot. Um, it looks like Meeker was in serious danger. He could easily have been. Uh, the log appears in more of its length in this same shot. I don't know, but it's brilliant in its own way. And speaking of brilliant, you can probably guess by now that James Stewart is one of my very favorite actors. And this is him near the end of the film doing what he does best, in particular in these films, letting his humanity show through a desperate and obsessed character. And he's finally revealing himself in his truth to Janet Lee, which helps her to fall in love with him. And that is my final slide, folks. Hello, man. And outstanding as always. And I am in awe of your dedication to screen all the man's <laughs> Westerns in preparation, which would include Winchester 73, Bend of the River, the Far Country, and then the subsequent Man from Laramie. And this is quite a difference from the Man Stewart Western of the previous year, Bend, Bend, Bend of the River, which I think I mentioned, which contains a lot of those interior studio shots that are supposed to be take place outdoors and that look, that have that fake studio feel that the naked oh, yeah. spur does not have. And no. I can only assume that that was made for Universal International and they were more reluctant to uh, release control over the picture to the director in the way that MGM trusted man to do with the Naked Spur to go on location. And just while we're on this general topic of Westerns of this era, um, if any of our viewers have gotten smitten with these films and would like to see more, um, there is another series of Westerns with the same director and actor not Anthony Mann and James Stewart. The actor is Randolph Scott, and the director is named Bud Bedecker. 
and I'll spell that B-O-E-D-I-T-T-C-H-E-R. Now, neither of these men are of the stature of Man and Stewart, but there is good stuff in these other films. There are seven of them, and they have titles like Seven Men From Now and Westbound and Decision at Sundown. I could go on and on, but if you're looking for more stuff, it's out there from the same vintage. A great recommendation. And just a, a quick point here. I, I, I cheated. I, I consulted on, on Wikipedia for this one. But The Naked Spur was filmed in Lone Pine, California, and on location in the San Juan Mountains and Durango in Colorado. And also, it premiered in February of 1953. It had a budget of slightly over $1.2 million, which in today would be a little under $14 million. And it did very, very well commercially. We'll go, we're going to go on and talk about the actors and their backgrounds. But before we do, Stephen, anything you'd like to chime in about the Naked Spur, the psychology of the film, the way the narrative is laid out? Any thoughts that come to mind? Well, one thought that comes to mind is just I'm always fascinated when I hear. And, and by the way, Daniel, that was wonderful. Uh, it's thank like you. getting two terrific lectures for the price of one. Uh, thank you for that. Watching the clips, the images that you chose and rewatching the trailer reminded me of that remark that Nina Mann made about her father being terrified of having his head underwater. And, uh, you know, when he was dunked underwater by that cruel teacher. So I think that that probably explains, sorry, my cat is making a little noise over here. Just ignore her. Okay. Uh, but uh, but that, that was something very much on my mind in thinking about that Ralph Meeker sequence. And he was probably harnessed, you know, underneath uh, as a way to protect him the way Keaton was. I think of like our, our hospitality in that early Keaton film where he accidentally, the rope broke and he went sailing down loose. But uh, by the 50s, they probably had pretty good harnesses for people. And... Uh, I like that you mentioned Robert Ryan because I, I know his daughter a little bit. I really with Ryan with all of his film noir credentials and like another figure of both noir and westerns, Dan Durier. They were apparently two of the most nice, sensitive people in Hollywood. It's just extraordinary how different their on-screen personas were. Richard Richard Woodmark being another example of that. And, and Max, I was fascinated, uh, and, and Daniel, by everything you said about man's love of working in the outdoors, because it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to do. And you know, most directors were fine working in the studio a lot of the time, and of course Hitchcock preferred it because of the control he had. And when you look at the, the films that man really cut his teeth on in the 1940s, T-Man, Raw Deal, you know, the sections of He Walked by Night that he did, you see someone uh, who is so confident or uh, 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 working with the outdoors. And again, for, for audience members who never have to think about those things, it is infinitely more difficult to get a really beautiful shot outdoors. And Daniel, I love what you did in, in sharing that. So uh, that, oh, and the only other thing I was going to say, and, and did I mention that, that the $1.2 million, that was almost exactly the average price of a movie, uh, a budget of a movie in 1953. And that's saying a lot because this was done on location and it shows that man again learned uh, from a lot of thrifty productions in the 40s how to get what he wanted because it is more expensive to go out on location and take out all that equipment and do those things something we're never happily conscious of when we're watching the movie but it is so much harder to make a film and i think it's a testament to his skill as a director that he could not only execute what he wanted but get such a fine film and get such terrific performances uh, with not the extra amount of money that a lot of filmmakers would have needed to, to work uh, out on location. The amount, of, Go ahead. Uh, the amount of just extra energy and work involved. I mean, not only are you bringing lights with you, but you have to bring your own electricity with you in the form of a generator truck, which has to be silenced so it won't interfere with the sound recording blah 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 it's never easy and then oh let's do a reverse angle well we got to cross over this ridge here and down that trail i mean it's tough and you have this massive which which we've talked about before but this massive technicolor camera that presumably this was the three negative three strip technicolor thing which is a behemoth yeah. That makes filming on location even more of a challenge, I would, I would think. It and, is, and I think part of the reason that a studio like MGM that used to hate going on location in the Louis B. Mayer years, and Louis B. Mayer was gone by the 
about a year after the, by the time this film was made, was that television had taken over the entertainment industry so completely that the studios. I think you're uh, we, you refer, you're a little bit frozen, Stephen. If you can repeat, see on television. So a with yes, I'm sorry about that. I was just saying that television was a. I hope you can hear me, uh, but just basically that television was was such a threat that this kind of Technicolor film shot on location with a Jimmy Stewart was. Uh, a very smart way to try to get people back into the movie theaters. Now, if people can only think of uh, an equivalent in 2022, not yours, but I mean, I'm thinking <laughs> about the multiplexes. Uh, it, it will be interesting. It's it's a cyclical thing the business faces. And and man's love of locations ultimately, I think, shortened his life a bit because he, especially as the pictures got bigger and bigger, he wanted to handle all the second unit photography. So you have these magnificent scenes in Cimarron, which is a film he walked off of that he insisted on directing himself and that are amazing, yeah. but he probably could have lived a little longer had he let a second unit person handle some of that, but he obviously loved filming on filming on location. Yeah. And in there's the other interview with Nina Mann on the Criterion edition of The Furies, where she just flips off a sentence saying, well, he was always out on location. Well, that tells you something about the lives that these people led. And, you know, if you are a working craftsperson, a director of photography, an actor, a, a script supervisor or a script girl, as it was back then, you're away from home a lot. And that does damage to your parenting and your relationships. It's no wonder Hollywood is a morass of, of broken marriages. Yeah. Um, it, it's really stressful. And I've lived through part of that myself. But well, we especially, it, it's, it's powerful that you point that out because in Anthony Mann's case, between 1949 and 1950, he directed five feature films. He was just running from studio to studio. And yeah. I'm sure his family must never have seen him for that 12 to 18 month period. I thought maybe we could just talk a little bit about some of the amazing actors uh, that Dan was mentioning, and also Stephen as well. Robert Ryan, uh, he came from Chicago. Mm. You gentlemen may know this, but when he was at Dartmouth, he held the, the college's heavyweight championship in boxing. He was a championship boxer. And after graduating, he held a variety of manual labor jobs, including <laughs> A ranch hand, which is great if you're going to make a Western later, but also my favorite, he was a debt collector for a while. A while. Can you imagine getting a knock on the door and it's Robert Wine wanting you to pay up a bill that you haven't paid? But he's going to receive stage tra training through Max Reinhardt's theatrical workshop in Hollywood. He's This is the late 30s. By 1940, he's appearing in small parts of Paramount. He's going to be in Clifford Odets's Clash by Night on Broadway in the early 40s. Then comes an RKO contract, and that's in the 40s is where he's acting for Jean Renoir, for Edward Dimitrik, Fred Zinnemann at MGM in Act of Violence, Robert Wise in The Setup, Max Ophuls in Caught. So he's doing some extraordinary work. And R Ryan could play a very smarmy, very frightening villain, but he also could play kind of a sexy He-Man uh, artist as he did in an, an unusual Nicholas Ray film with Joan Fontaine called Born to be Bad. He's actually a decent guy there. And when Anthony Mann was interviewed by Cahiers du Cinema, and he's, because uh, he directed Ryan in a few years later in God's Little Acre, the Cahiers du Cinema interviewer asked Mann why Robert Ryan, and this is by the 1960s, why wasn't he a, a bigger actor? Why, uh, by that time. And man's response was, that's due, I think, to a purely physical detail. Robert is an immense guy, very American, only he lacks the eyes. Have you noticed that all the great stars from the, that, whom the public loves have clear eyes? And he mentions Gary Cooper, James Stewart, John Wayne, Clark Gable, Charlton Heston, Henry Fonda, Lancaster, Kirk Douglas, Peter O'Toole. And man says the eyes do everything. They're the permanent reflection of the internal flame which animates the hero. Without those eyes, you can aspire only to second string roles. 
And Robert Ryan did have these kind of moon-shaped eyes that never were quite open entirely, and maybe that distanced himself. I thought that was a fascinating observation. That is a fascinating observation. I've never yeah. now. I'm definitely going to be watching Robert Ryan films in a different way for a while. <laughs> but a, a fabulous, fabulous actor. And uh, Ralph Meeker, interesting as well. Uh, came from Minneapolis. Uh, he had been on Broadway in the late twenties. Uh, Jose Ferrer, Ferrer was uh, staging plays on Broadway. Gave him a part in Cyrano de Bergerac and another production. Meeker took over Marlon Brando's role on stage in Streetcar Named Desire. And then he's going to appear in Mr. Roberts and Picnic by William Inge. And then finally, he'll be appearing in Hollywood films of the 50s. I know Dan mentions several such as Kiss Me Deadly. Uh, and Eric, uh, another sexy, charismatic, but actor that you don't always trust his character. He can go in either direction, which is what makes him so compelling. And it's too bad he didn't have more of a career after the 1960s. I agree. Dan mentioned Millard yeah. Mitchell. We yeah. spoke about him the previous year when uh, when he was the, the lovely, cuddly studio head in Sing It in the Rain. This is going to be Millard Mitchell's last film. He, uh, he died on not long after the film was was, was finished. Uh, Janet Lee had been groomed by MGM as an ingenue as late as 1947 when she was in her 20s. This, I think, is one of her more interesting and challenging roles. Do you gentlemen yeah. agree? Oh, yes. She is absolutely convincing in this part. There is never a false moment. Um, I would add, I don't know if this means much, but um, by this point, she was, I think, married to Tony Curtis. And yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Curtis had one of his early roles in Winchester 73, where he was credited as Anthony Curtis. So they were playing around with the name thing there. But um, maybe Tony said, hey, check out my wife. She's pretty good. I don't know. I'm sure there were other casting channels working rather than a husband recommending his wife but because we think of this as a man's well, pun not intended but a man's western yet it's mostly male roles but but the role of the, the women in his films are often very interesting and he often gets very compelling performances as he did from janet lee and another thing that that dan mentioned in his observations of the, the visual look of the film what i think stands out you mentioned dan it was the the element of desolation after the terrible shootout with the Indians when Stewart has been wounded and he's in the foreground and you have the, the dead bodies in the background. Was, was that a partially silhouetted shot of Stewart? Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, his face is all dark. There's a sense of tragedy there that I think not a lot of other directors would have hooked onto. That man, it prevents us from feeling any elation that you're supposed to feel in a Western when, when this kind of violence is taking place. A uh, man, I think, diffuses that with this sense of tragedy and loss. And which also, there's a moment in T-Man, his crime picture, where one of the real bad guys is about, is about to get shot by the, the hero. And if you listen carefully, right before he gets shot, he says, don't, and he gets shot. And I've never, ever seen that in a crime picture in a, in a Hollywood film, where it's, it's a pathetic moment yeah. that, that if you pay attention, it, 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 it brings another level to the material that I don't think a lot of other directors possess, but that's just a theory. Well, in one of the, the interviews we've been referring to, the questioner asks Mann if he was influenced by Hawks because, they had just interviewed Howard Hawks, I guess. I don't know. And, and uh, man said, no, actually, his biggest influence was John Ford. And you can kind of see that in these emotional moments injected into a film where other directors would ignore them or elide them, glide right past them. But man is not afraid to tell you, yeah, this character is mourning the loss of these dead Indians. So yeah, I think that's important. one reason the films age so well, or rather that they don't age in the way many films do at the time. I say, and I don't mind if a film is dated in many respects. That is, we, we acknowledge conventions of it. I think that the man westerns and the best of the uh, Bud Bedecker westerns have an incredibly contemporary flavor to them, or better put perhaps a timelessness about them because the people are treated with such humanity and uh, there, there's a lot more gray than black and white in them. 
And he stated that in one, in, in one of his 1960 s interviews, and I'm paraphrasing here that that not all people are bad, not all people are good, and he likes to bring that out in in the roles that he plays. There are a couple of lines of dialogue that I think capture the naked spur well. Robert Ryan messing with people's heads when he says, uh, "The closer we get to Abilene, the more you got to worry." Just just you know, just tightening the screws out of anxiety. <laughs> Yeah. And, and also, uh, Millard Mitchell, and, and I, I hope I'm quoting this correctly, where at one point he says, it's getting so I don't know who to point this thing at. And he's talking about his rifle, <laughs> because we don't know who the villain or the hero is anymore. <laughs> and that line could be could sum up Anthony Mann's entire filmography in many ways. It's worthy of an Oscar nomination for writing. Absolutely. And, and just, Dan, you inspired me to just double check this on the, the Oscar situation. It's a short list of Oscar winners related to, to Westerns. The original Cimarron got an Oscar for screenplay. Edward Dimitrix, Broken Lance in 1954 won for script. And then Butch Cassidy for William Goldman. Other than that, it's been a few nominations here and there, which you're yeah. including for the Naked, the Naked Spur. And I, I want to cite one other thing about my hero, Jim Stewart, because yeah, um, I don't think people say it enough. This guy could really ride a horse. Now, I'm not an equestrian. I've been on horses and I know the difference between someone who can and can't ride. And I was making a comparison while I was at the West End Cinema run by New Plaza Cinema watching the power of the dog. And there's a scene when Benedict Cumberbatch playing Phil is riding his horse right next to young Peter, the guy that he's supposed to be teaching. Peter is sitting firmly in the saddle and Cumberbatch is bouncing up and down through the whole scene. And I just thought, no, that would not happen with Jim Stewart or even Rory Calhoun. I mean, you name one of them, they knew how to ride. So just citing that for the record, folks. We do take for granted that you had to have all these skills if you were going to be in a, in a Western. You had to know how to ride. Yeah. And uh, Richard, I, and I forgot, uh, Stephen, maybe Dan, maybe you, you read this somewhere as well, where someone had commented that a number of the actors who made a lot of Westerns or appeared occasionally ended up having he a serious hearing loss from the firing of the blanks. And Richard Widmark was one of them. But you want to think of all the shooting that's, that's going on during, during these productions. It is quite, uh, it's very labor intensive and, and uh, it takes a kind of durable nature that I think most actors today don't have. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. It, it is. And just as an aside, you reminded me that I did a biography profile of, for A&E of Richard Widmark and got to spend many months with him. And he recalled working with James Stewart on John Ford's Two Road Together in the early 60s. And my memory of the anecdote he, he shared was that they all had hearing problems. And it was a series of them all having to say what, what to each other throughout the production. <laughs> And there you go. There's the, there's the story. There, that's, that's when it's been confirmed. The 1950s equivalent of a rock band reunion now. What was that? That's right. <laughs> but it's, it's, very, hazards. it's very impressive. And I just a couple of more statistics here. I counted at least 55 minutes into the film before we get to a, a real studio shot, which are the, the cave scene where they're, they're inside when it's raining outside. Am, am I correct there, Dan? Yes, and I just want to say, I actually timed it out. The movie is 91 minutes. The cave scene is 11 minutes. That means the movie was 88% filmed on exteriors. Unheard of, unheard, unheard of. of in that era. Ab absolutely astonishing. I know I, I could go on with questions for both of you, but I know we have people out there that would love to share some questions. Let's hear it. Bef before we open things up, we are going to have our next New Plaza Cinema lecture. It's going to be a week from Wednesday, June 1st. And Stephen Smith is going to be giving a lecture on pre-code Hollywood, sex, sin, and censorship in the 1930s. Normally, I would run a trailer for this special program, but we have a real trailer here today. Uh, Stephen, tell us a little bit about this presentation and what we can expect. I'm not as attractive as Joan Blondell or Anne Dvorak or the people I think of as the great pre-code actors, but yes, I had the, the, the privilege being someone who loves 
pre-code cinema. And for those who don't know, pre-code cinema is the period from 1930 to 1934, July 1934 to be exact, when uh, a code of, of rules, the do's and don'ts, were, were written and Hollywood had agreed to follow them but really didn't. And you get movies that are that were censored upon reissue. At least one is lost completely. The Warner Brothers film uh, Convention City with all of their great players in it. That's a, a film everyone's searching for. But this was the time of the public enemy. King Kong, uh, racy Gene Harlow movies, racy Anne Dvorak movies, uh, Warren William in a, as a predatory boss uh, anticipating Me Too by many years. But also a year where, where studios, uh, I think, were more critical of society uh, in films like I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. So those are the topics that I talk about with a lot of great clips. Oh, and how could I forget Barbara Stanwyck in Babyface and Night Nurse and many others. Uh, she, you know, It's amazing that she already by the 1930s had made this major mark on a, a genre of film. So yes, please join us for pre-code cinema. Uh, I, I promise you will not be disappointed when you see the footage from these films. Some of it is very rare. We're also following that up the following Sunday with a talk back on Night Nurse. I'm presuming, of course, you will be joining us for that, Stephen. I will. I'm very happily. That's one of my favorite pre-code titles, Barbara Stanwyck. And I won't say who plays the villain, but I'll just say you will be very surprised when you see who it is. My yeah. lips are sealed. My lips are sealed. No, that's good. That's, Stephen, that's going to be very exciting and fantastic. And I can't wait to, to see your presentation as well. You can go to newplazacinema.org to book your tickets today. And thank you, Stephen, for, for participating in that a week from Wednesday. And now, Lori, I will uh, ask that you assist us taking questions. We can't hear you, Lori. audio is off, Lori. You're muted. You're still muted, Lori. Okay, there we go. Shoshana, if you could start your video and unmute yourself. Shoshana, there we go. All right. I just wanted to remark it, it goes, it's in line with everything you were saying about the uniqueness to me of this movie is that the hero, the uh, cries at the end, a cowboy who cries, uh, sobbing that he, he didn't want to, he didn't want to sell a person for money. Uh, just that was extremely unusual. And I don't know how many other Westerns that happened in. I'm trying to think, and, and I'm having difficulty finding a comparative well, scene. I, I can point out some of the other Man Stewart Westerns where um, Stewart is at such a high pitch of desperation and obsession that eventually he breaks down from that. And as I said, shows his humanity and uh, check out the other films and check out a lot of other Stewart films. This was, again, I, I didn't say this earlier, but it's a common thing about Stewart's career that after World War II, when he had flown bombing missions over Europe and watched massive devastation, that the films he was in changed. His characters became more dark, more complicated, more obsessed. And this is part of the trajectory of his career. So I attach a lot of that to these two people, Mann and Stewart. Yeah. And I, may I just say, I, I think Shoshana is absolutely right. Many leading actors of the 30s and 40s did not want to cry in films. And I think the studios did not want them to cry. And on Gone with the Wind, Gable resisted crying after the death of his character's daughter. And it was Olivia de Havilland who persuaded him uh, that, that she said it denotes strength and compassion. And uh, so she, I, I think you're right. And that's what makes these films so extraordinary. Thank you, Shoshana. Um, Joshua, if you can unmute and raise your hand, if anyone else has questions, we only have one more person after Joshua. Um, please hit the reaction button to raise your hand. Hi, Joshua. Welcome. Okay. Can Hello. you hear me? We yeah. can. Welcome okay. back. Um, two comments. First of all, I don't know whether uh, someone in New Plaza uh, previously recommended the book, but I ended up reading uh, Hank and Jimmy, which is a remarkable book. Uh, uh, 
Fonda and Stewart were roommates uh, when they started acting and they kept a close friendship throughout the years, even though their politics were entirely different. Uh, their acting techniques were entirely different, but it said a lot about the character of each of them, uh, this book. Uh, and if anyone hasn't read it, I recommend it. Yeah. The second thing, thing comment I was going to make was you were talking about um, uh, people who played in cowboy movies losing their hearing. Um, when I was in the Navy during the time of Noah, um, uh, when you, if, if you were a submariner and you were going to re-enlist or were going to enlist as a submariner, you got a huge uh, enlistment bonus. And the reason was this was the era of the boombox. And the Navy was having a terrible time getting people who weren't impa hearing impaired and could operate the sonar. So it was, it, it, it was a problem that was, uh, that carried on in, into other industries. Anyway, I just thought you might find that interesting. Oh, Joshua, that, that's terrific. And you've inspired me to, to track down that book on, on Stuart and Fonda. Fonda is, is going to appear in an Anthony Mann Western later in the 50s called The Tin Star, which is fascinating. And, and Stuart and Fonda both started out in the theater and Mann directed Stuart back when Mann was known as Anton Bunzman. He, he directed him several times at a summer stock theater in Long Island and before Stuart went to MGM. So they had an association going back to the uh, to 1934 at least but thank you so much joshua thank you joshua okay um joel hi uh, great presentation guys i really enjoyed it thank you um this doesn't concern the uh, naked spur specifically but you talked about the great output like man making uh five movies in two years and i'm wondering with the studio system and all of that era did people spend um did people did, Directors spend less time on post production and editing than they do now. I mean, yeah, they yeah. basically you know, give the film back to the studios and the studios cut it and they, they were on to the next project. And maybe even a less time in pre production with the storyboarding and things like that, too. Yes, 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 and yes. Michael Powell, in his very famous, the first part of his two part massive uh, bio autobiography on his life in the cinema, said that. And I'm paraphrasing once again that many people aren't aware that a director's job often ends when he stops shouting at the actors, that the, that the film is mixed and edited after he's gone on to it or he or she has gone on to another project. That, of course, has changed now. But at the time we're talking here in the 40s and 50s, with few exceptions, directors were not always present in these, in these post-production processes. Stephen may have more information on that, but in my book I had mentioned that crazy year for man where he worked on five films in, in one year. There's no way he could have been involved in the editing of every single film. He may have been around or supervising some of it, but most of it was likely completed by others And once he moved on to another project. Stephen, perhaps you have some thoughts to add. Yes, you're absolutely right. At a studio like Fox, for example, a journeyman like Henry Hathaway would shoot a film, probably supervise a first cut or at least be involved with the footage being assembled, and then uh, would be working on his next movie by the time its scoring began. So directors very seldom had involvement in the music of the films unless that music was part of the film that you heard uh, diegetically, as they say, the characters are hearing it or something like that. And uh, John, some directors had the opportunity but chose not to. John Huston comes to mind. I was always surprised that he would generally leave the post-production and the scoring of films to others. And <clears throat> it, it varies a little bit, but it's safe to say that especially at the height of the studio system. I mean, in the 1930s, you worked six days a week, all night, and if you finished a movie on Saturday, you started a new one on Monday. If you were Michael Curtiz or poor Joan Blondell, who did 10 movies in, I think it's 1932 or 33, and uh, you know, even when things weren't that extreme, 
uh, like is in the 40s or this transitional period of the 50s, it was unusual for the studio, uh, for the directors to be involved. That said, the exceptions were directors who were also their own producers and who elected, and, and that became more and more the norm that, that for example, Nicholas Ray bringing in Leonard Rosenman on uh, Rebel Without a Cause, uh, Alex North, someone who wasn't really known for film coming in to do Streetcar. Uh, sometimes, this is the period when some independent filmmakers are coming into the system, and they were usually more involved in post-production, but yes, typically for a director like Mann who cut his teeth you know, in the 40s and, and was work strongly working in the 50s, uh, they, didn't, they didn't work in the post-production very much, I think, I think in the case of Mann. What was eye-opening for me when Joseph McBride, a historian whom we re recently interviewed here on Billy Wilder, he wrote a book on Howard Hawks. And Howard Hawks's Western Red River was one of the rare cases where Hawks was around with somebody's... Uh, that was one film where Hawks was actually around for the editing. Most of the times, Hawks simply moved on and leaving his picture behind. I thought that was fascinating. Well, the metaphor is that you can think of the Hollywood studios as an assembly line where each person stood in to work on his craft and then left the assembly line and moved to another one. So uh, there was, it was rare as we have cited for a, a journeyman director to handle more than just the shouting at the actors. But you, then this holds true for pre-production as well, the storyboarding, the planning, you know, even it depends on the project, uh, yeah. but certainly in some cases, for example, uh, the day the earth stood still comes to mind. Everyone calls that a film by Robert Wise, and Wise did a beautiful job directing it. But there was a script by Edmund North, I believe, completed by the time that Zanuck decided to assign Robert Wise. That takes nothing away from how Robert Wise directed the film, but he didn't write it. And when his friend Bernard Herman was hired to do the music. Uh, Robert Wise said, Benny, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I trust you completely, because it was, had some electronic instruments sub, sub, uh, supplementing the orchestra. And Robert Wise said, I don't understand, but I trust you. And then he went on to make another film. So uh, it, it just depended a little bit case by case. But it was certainly true that sometimes a director would start a movie with very little involvement in the pre-production. The day the earth stood still, the robot had two costumes. One with the seams in the front for the rear shots, and one with the seams in the back for the front shots. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. I'm impressed you know that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Joe Feynman, you'll be our last question unless someone else raised their hands. Can you unmute and start your video, please? Hi, Joe. You need to unmute. There you go. Now unmute. We can't hear you, Joe. We need you okay. there. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I knew nothing about the Naked Spur uh, and very little about Anthony Mann, but of course, everything that uh, Plaza Cinema does, I'm fascinated by, as I was by this presentation, and it really warms my heart because I'm a film person and had worked in the industry starting in 1970. Uh, so I have one comment about the film and a couple of comments that you might be interested in. Number one, at the beginning of this film, I was really shocked by the fact that Jimmy Stewart suddenly is a villain to me. And I'm not sure as the movie proceeds, who's the villain and who's the hero, which uh, was very unusual. And uh, it, it really uh, surprised me and it engaged me that uh, uh, that this was uh, just an unusual film and it kept me going and it made me think of heroes and anti-heroes and so forth and it right up to nearly the end uh, and the emotions of all of these characters really developed in a very advanced way I thought and so the writing of course was uh, just superior. Beautifully stated and welcome to the world of Anthony Mann and also mm -hmm. coming coming out of the film noir genre where you don't always know who the hero and the villain is at the beginning, but but you hit on that point perfectly. Right. So I wanted to make a couple of comments. One is uh, an, an executive in post-production starting in 1970 about film and uh, director's cuts. Um, you're talking about an earlier area where I uh, had was very young, but around 1970, I got involved in film. And of course the director's, Guild 
um, probably around that time mandated that a director had 26 weeks in post-production. So directors were there. If they weren't there, it's because they got fired. And it was in all of the movies that I did, which is around 150, uh, director was 99% of the time was there, whether they hated him or not, he was there, definitely. Yeah, yeah the business um, definitely changed by that time, yes. Yeah, and 26 weeks was the minimum. Um, often a post-production could go on far longer than that, and most of the time it did, uh, particularly in independent cinema. The other comment I wanted to make is they're talking about sound and loudness and gunshots and so forth. Um, there was a period when sound mixers were involved in the making of uh, trailers. And to get them onto a screen, they had to be so loud that the uh, projectionists were complaining and the sound mixers were complaining. And Dolby was a, vic a victim of this. Uh, and what would happen is that you'd go into a mixing stage and you had to put your hands over your ears. What the mixers did is they ended up putting earplugs in their ears when they were mixing trailers. And it, it got to such a point where the theaters, the projectionists were forced to put uh, governors on the, the boards in the theaters to prevent them from going beyond a certain level. So that was just an interesting thing because mixers were having hearing problems and very much as rock and roll performers uh, were having hearing problems. So just a point of interest. That is an amazing point of interest because our, our big us frequent film goers, our biggest complaints usually are how loud the trailers are, though not at New Plaza Cinema. But but uh, th that's that's thank you for sharing that with us, Joe. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. you. We have one more hand up, Claudine. If you could um, start. Yes. Hi. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for what a wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask about the sound. Um, I don't know if it was Stephen Smith. One of you mentioned the equipment on location for recording sound. And what happened afterwards? Didn't they have to loop a lot? Could you explain that, please? Somebody, <laughs> thank you. I think it was Daniel who spoke the most about that. I'll say that many lines are looped uh, on film shot in exterior simply because whether it's water or a plane flying over, you're so much more susceptible to things you can't control. But it was Daniel, I think, who spoke uh, primarily about the equipment on location. Well, yeah, I mean, um, they made, shall we say, an honest effort. The old college tried to get it recorded. But if they were fighting too many elements, wind was another big factor that it would blow right across a microphone um, and distort things. So they did the best they could, but they could rely on looping and other effects to be brought in in post-production if necessary. Joel, did you have another question or was, did you forget to put your yes, hand? Yes, just talk about looping. Maybe you could just fill us in because you know, we've seen stuff about like early Beatles trying to record the early 60s and only having a, one or two tracks to work with initially. And they got four tracks and eight tracks and they thought they were like, you know, in heaven and they could add more and more instruments. Um, so how did they go about adding many layers of sound back when the technology was so limited? I can speak to that a little unless one of you gentlemen would no, like No, please to. go for it. Uh, when the talkies began, there were only basically three tracks that you could combine together. Uh, and then every year the sound technology really rather amazingly got better. By 1936, you have a vastly improved soundtrack. And then by the time of The Naked Spur, you have magnetic uh, recording, you have cassette tapes, you have uh, things take th that were learned during World War II. So you have, uh, this is the year 1953, when stereo suddenly became a very big deal. Fox was releasing its films in Cinemascope and stereo, as was MGM in many cases, not all. 
Um, and this sh this film was shot before that in 1952, released at the very beginning of 53, so it's not in stereo. But the technology had really gotten into a place that, that would be recognized as the way the, the system until the era of Dolby by the time of The Naked Spur, where you could put, combine many film tracks. And uh, yes, recording albums seems to have been you know behind the times on film, but film uh, did not really have a problem by the 1950s in combining tracks. Multiple Were they track. able to put something on and take it out if they didn't like it? Did it give them that kind of flexibility? Well, as as we mentioned, if a line wasn't recorded clearly, it was no problem at all to do the ADR, the looping on a soundstage later where the actors are watching it and, and uh, trying to sync their lips up to it and usually doing a very good job of it. Uh, so, yeah, sound, sound was in a good place by 1953 when they made this. Thank you. Although with, with a trained ear, sometimes you can usually tell when they've dubbed it over than when it's on location, but it's, it's, yeah. it's hard to, it's very difficult work. Because in the modern era, more and more gets shot on location and less and less at the studio. Um, I've heard up to like 80% of, you know, dialogue is overdubbed on, um, feature, on anything, TV shows, whatever, because they're shooting on location so much. And this doesn't even begin to talk about what happened in Italy, where they <laughs> they post synced everything uh, up to a certain point. But anyway, well, gentlemen, this has been phenomenal. Thank yeah, you. What a Thank great, you what for great. joining us, Daniel. And I will turn things over to Laura. I don't know if Sean is yeah. here. No, um, I'm just going to say, um, Stephen, um, if you could. Um, Tell us the date again of your next lecture with us. I'd like you to tell me the date because I don't want to get it wrong. No, I'm okay. just okay. It's June first. June yes, first at three p.m. Eastern time. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Max. It's very, 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 very fun. This will be fast paced, full of things that will raise your eyebrows, things you have not seen before. I'm going to. Guess. I don't think. I don't think people realize how body films were in the early days you know like i think everyone thinks they were always so chaste and they were so not <laughs> fun times at least yeah. on the screen yeah. make it salacious steve <laughs> all right they will <laughs> all right everyone have a great rest of your sunday can i just ask Everybody. a question sure um will you be sending out an email to register with regard to the pre-code hollywood if you go on new plaza cinema yeah, there's an email coming out this afternoon. Good. And and again, newplazacinema.org, and you can always find them and sign up there too. Thank you. Guys, could I just say one thing? There's a sure. sequence in the new uh, Downton Abbey film about looping and recording in the, the series was around 19, it takes around 1930 which is really fascinating. I don't think they did it at that time, but if you see the movie, it's it's funny. It's funny and, and, and really entertaining. I hear there's a film component of that that's a real blast, so I can't wait. Oh yeah, it's really, it's good. I saw it, it's a good movie. If, if you're a Downton Abbey fan, you'll love it. And if you're a movie fan, you'll love it. Okay, well. See you next time and also at our West End Cinema on 86th Street. Take yes. care, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Stephen. Day. Thank you, Dan. My pleasure. Thank you.